Shall we rise up? Let's close our eyes for prayer. Bless your name because of the things you are revealing and exposing to us. We just pray that you will lead us into the word again right now. Stand the truth upon our hearts. As you teach us, we pray that we learn enough so that we will be of the maximum benefit to all the people who are waiting for us back in the various nations. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's be seated, please. We want to consider the responsibility of everyone that is called of God to lead people to the knowledge of the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, which is preaching the gospel. We have a mandate, we have a commission, the commandment is given out, we must preach the gospel. In Mark chapter 16, <clears throat> verse 15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Going, we have gone. Into all the world, we have gone to some parts of the world. But then the Lord is telling us that when we get there, as long as we are staying there, our responsibility, our assignment is to preach the gospel. In Romans chapter 10, from verse 13 to verse 17, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We read in Mark that Jesus Christ gave this commandment or commission to his own disciples that they should go and preach the gospel. By the grace of God, we as missionaries have responded to that call. We have not only heard the general call as we read from the Bible, we have also received the special call of the Lord. You know it in your heart. You know the Lord himself has sent you. Here the Apostle Paul says, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, how shall they preach except they be sent? It's important then that if we know we are sent, there is something we ought to do. You have been sent, and you are sent to do something. Preach. What are we to preach? In verse 15, uh, where we have read, it says, How beautiful are the feet of them, the feet of them, those who are sent to preach the gospel. Again, it's preaching the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. So then we have uh, the sentence, preach the gospel, that we have read together in these three passages. Jesus gave the commandment. Paul the apostle emphasized it's only those who are sent, who actually and ultimately would preach the gospel in a great sense. And then it says, for those who have been called, for those who have been sent, like he had been called and sent, necessity is laid upon every one of us. 
and the necessity is that we must preach that gospel. And then if we preach not the gospel, we cannot remain at ease. We'll not have our peace, we'll be uh, uneasy, we'll feel inconvenient, we'll have the consciousness within us that somehow, somewhere, we are disobeying the Lord. And uh, the believer or the minister of the gospel who lives under the uh, consciousness that is disobedient to the Lord all the time is really living under a burden he has no grace to carry. And so then we will preach the gospel. Necessity is laid upon us we are to preach the gospel. And uh, you preach the gospel because on it lies the eternal destiny of men. So it's not something that we can play with or joke with. The destiny of the men in the nations you have gone to lie on your preaching the gospel. Two, we must preach the gospel because there is a devil who blinds and deafens men if he cannot immediately kill them. And they need the gospel. He will blind them, he will uh, deafen them, he will make sure that uh, they will not even want to hear uh, if, he, if he cannot kill them immediately. And because the devil is working actively on just hindering men and women from receiving the gospel, that's why we must do our best right now, preach the gospel. Three, we must preach the gospel because Christ and Calvary cry out to be heard. Christ has suffered on Calvary. His blood has been shed. And the story of Calvary, the story of atonement is the gospel message. And because Christ is calling out and is still saying, I've done everything I ought to do, tell the people we must preach the gospel. For we must preach the gospel because herein lies the solution to the age-long problems of men. Actually, men uh, all over the world, they confess to the fact that there are problems. Problems in government, go go uh, problems with the people, problems with families, and the age-long standing problems of men can only be solved ultimately by the preaching of the gospel and the receiving of the gospel message. Preach the gospel because, number five, silence is sin. We are commanded to preach it, and therefore the only thing we can do is to preach that gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach when the Spirit prompts you. Whoever is uh, before you, whoever you are staying with, and whoever the contacts are, as the Spirit of the Lord is specially reminding you of your responsibility, preach that gospel. Preach when people call, ask, or invite. Anywhere there is a ready mind, anywhere there is an open ear, everywhere there is somebody listening or somebody wanting to know, preach that gospel. Preach when the doors of opportunity are open. Because doors don't always keep open. And as uh, you have gone out and doors of opportunities have uh, been opened, preach the gospel. When darkness seems to be gathering upon the nation, upon the people, preach the gospel. Bring in the light. You know that when night is coming, when the darkness is gathering, uh, every household will, will immediately begin to look for the light. And as you know that in the nations where you have gone, darkness seems to be gathering together upon the people. Then it's time for you to bring in the light, preach the gospel. We must preach the gospel when Satan's ministers are preaching the philosophy of godlessness. And you know, in various uh, nations, in various uh, cities, uh, you will not be strangers to the fact that there are messengers of the devil who are very, very busy preaching the philosophy of godlessness in uh, places that are even supposed to be churches uh, where they ought to be glorifying Christ. Uh, this is the same thing that is going on. What then do you have to do except preaching the gospel at such a time like that? 
we're commanded and ours is to obey. And obedience will mean that we as ministers and missionaries will preach the gospel. But then, what gospel? Galatians chapter 1. Reading from verse 6. At the time of uh, the early church, the true gospel was there. The real gospel was there. But then there was the another gospel. A gospel of another kind. A gospel that was based on another foundation. A gospel that was perverted. A gospel that did not save. And so we ought to know what type of gospel we're going to preach. Let's say the type of gospel we don't, uh, we shouldn't preach. In Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God unto another gospel. That other gospel, the one that doesn't have its foundation on Christ, the one that doesn't have its doctrines as the doctrines of the Bible, the, doc, the one that doesn't uh, bring about the life of Christ and the people that receive it, the one that makes the basis of, um, of um, acceptance of the Lord, not repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but the works of man hand, man's hand, that's another gospel. That's not the one we're to preach. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which, ye have, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Well then, we are to preach the gospel. From this uh, passage we have read, not everybody that is preaching from the Bible is preaching the gospel. There are so many preachers, even though they may label it gospel, but we must examine what they preach. Is that actually the true gospel, the real gospel? Now, the gospel that the Lord wants us to preach is spelled out from the letters of the word gospel itself. G for grace. If the gospel we're preaching is the true gospel, it will start with the message of grace, the grace of God. O in the gospel, obedience through that grace. We must preach the gospel preaching the grace of God then we must preach that when, the, when people come into uh, the gospel and they are saved by that gospel, their lives will show obedience. S, salvation. Full salvation, free salvation, fruitful salvation, final salvation. That's the real gospel. That we preach salvation. Not just getting our sins forgiven, not just having the peace with God, having the peace of God as well, and having the whole nature and root of sin taken away, the full salvation, and everything that Calvary has purchased for us, having everything full, free, without the works of our hand, but depending totally on Christ, the foundation, fruitful, Something that uh, when we have received that gospel, the fruit is seen in our lives. And the gospel that is able to carry us right to the very gate of heaven. And we are finally, ultimately saved. P for power. One, power over sin. That's part of the gospel. Power over sickness. That's part of the gospel. Power over Satan. That's part of the gospel. Power over spirits. That's part of the gospel. And power in the Holy Ghost. That's part of the gospel. And if we're preaching the real gospel, we're preaching the power of God. And the people that come to receive that gospel, they receive power in their lives. E-evangelization of the world. 
You cannot preach the gospel without telling the people that receive that gospel to spread it, to communicate it to other people. And they ought to, everybody that hears the preaching of the gospel, ought to understand as part of the gospel. You are receiving it and you are sharing it uh, after you have received it. Evangelization of the world. L, life in Christ and life of Christ. Ultimately, what the gospel does in our lives is that it puts the life of Christ within us and it makes us to live in Christ. And uh, from the time we receive that gospel till the time we see Christ face to face, our desire is that that we will be conformed to the image of the Son of God. Now, the grace of God. If we're going to preach the gospel, number one, we've said we preach grace. That grace is available, but that grace is also accessible. We mustn't preach grace as if it is not available today. As if um, the person that uh, gets that uh, gospel, that gets what the gospel offers, will be a low-key exceptional person. We must show the people that it's available for them. And we must preach faith along with it that the people will know that it's accessible in Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Romans chapter 3, verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith, in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Many times we have found preachers laying the foundation of works, the foundation of self-righteousness in the people, the foundations of do's and don'ts, the foundation of do this and you live, rather than the foundation of grace. Believe this and thou shalt live. So we must uh, remind ourselves that preaching the gospel means to start with when the sinners come, we must make grace available and grace accessible to them. Of course, the grace of God will change them and transform them, make them new people. But the moment they come, the very first thing we are to expose them to is what Calvary, has, uh, what Calvary uh, means for us, what Christ has accomplished, and the fact that Jesus Christ has paid the whole price. Remember, uh, before you left, how we used to define grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. And you must often remind yourself, when you are challenged with uh, the task of preaching the gospel, when those sinners are before you, that no matter how vile they are, no matter how dirty they have been, how sinful they have been, the grace of God, without uh, any good works in their hand, can bring them from the depth of sin and make them to sit side by side with the Lord Jesus Christ, lifting them up to, uh, uh, to sit together with the Lord Jesus Christ in heavenly places. We preach the grace of God. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. We have access. Make it accessible. Don't make it so difficult that the people can't reach it. But we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, as the apostle here tells us that we have access by faith into this grace, we must understand that if we're preaching the gospel and we're emphasizing the grace of God, we must equally emphasize the faith that leads into that grace. The faith that makes it easy for us 
to just stretch out our hands and to tell the Lord we need the forgiveness, we need um, the peace of God, and we need what grace will do in our lives. In Acts chapter 14, verse 3. Acts 14, verse 3. Long time, therefore, abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Long time, they abode in a particular place, and they spoke boldly. And as they spoke, they were giving testimony. They were giving assurance unto the word of his grace. And the Lord granted them signs and wonders that were done by their hands. So then, we must preach the grace of God. And we must keep on learning from uh, the Bible on the grace of God. And we ourselves must keep on reminding uh, ourselves how we got into the gospel truth, into the gospel benefits. And we must know that it was when we knew it was by grace, we came into it. But then we must also preach obedience. There are people that uh, preach uh, grace without obedience, grace without human responsibility, Grace without commitment to the Lord. Grace that is uh, just sovereignly bestowed, but not uh, humanly accepted and uh, worked out in our lives. But the Bible doesn't know of any cheap uh, thing like that. When grace comes into our lives, it does a particular work in us. Preach the gospel. And we're preaching the gospel of grace, the gospel of obedience. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. And when it actually appears and when it comes into our hearts, when we receive of that grace, it does something in verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live so badly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So let's remember the real gospel, the true gospel of the New Testament of the Bible will lead us into obedience as the people have repented of their sins and they have been saved by grace through their faith. Now they will be led into a life of obedience, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts will now live so badly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Notice what follows, zealous of good works. Have you seen some people that pretend to have received the grace of God and they're never zealous of living right? They're never zealous of good works and they say, well, we're saved as if the salvation gave them a license to live in sin. But when we receive the grace of God and that grace of God actually uh, manifests in our lives, then we are purified, we are redeemed, and we are set aside for good works. In Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now you'll find that uh, if we do the work we ought to do well, we preach the gospel. We preach the gospel that they ought to be born again. But then immediately they say they are born again, all by the grace of God, there is a test of their obedience, whether they'll submit to water baptism or not. Or whether the religious uh, traditions uh, or the churchianity 
um, around them will hinder them from submitting to uh, but water baptism in obedience to the Lord. And right there at the beginning of uh, the Christian life, the professed Christian life, you'll know whether this person has received the genuine thing or not, whether he can now submit in obedience to water baptism, because he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And that obedience of righteousness will always be there at the beginning. And then in um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, uh, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. There will be obedience in fellowship. The grace of God has come into the heart of this individual, and the first thing he knows is that the moment he hears about water baptism, he wants to obey. And then the gospel you are preaching is the real gospel, the true gospel that leads him into the obedience of fellowship. He wants to continue in fellowship with the people of God when grace has actually entered in. Now, we cannot shy away from this. We cannot shy away from the real gospel, the whole gospel. Now, we just don't say, well, grace, grace, like an evangelist will go out and is telling them to uh, come to the Lord and get saved. But he doesn't tell them to obey the Lord in water baptism. Obey the Lord in fellowship of the body of Christ. Uh, if he is preaching the gospel, obedience will be part of that gospel. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They obeyed the Lord in uh, water baptism. Verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. They obeyed in fellowship, in uh, coming to fellowship, and then they obeyed, they started learning the apostles' doctrine, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. So then, we're preaching the gospel. We preach the grace of God. We make it available. We make it accessible for the people. Then, we preach obedience. Obedience in water baptism. Obedience in meeting together with other children of God. Obedience in uh, learning the apostles' doctrine, the doctrines of the Bible. In Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Have you noticed some so-called uh, Christians in the nations uh, where God has sent you to minister? They say that they have known the Lord. They talk about grace most of the time. But they never talk about doing the will of God. Haven't you sometimes seen so-called believers that will say, Well, I'm just a special pet favorite in the hand of the Lord that uh, he lets me go in the permissive will of God. And they rejoice in it. And they do not understand that when they are deliberately living out of the perfect will of God as it's revealed to them, they are not doing the will of the Father which is in heaven. They're living literally in disobedience. And that grace of God in them will not carry them through if it doesn't have obedience following after. Have you seen some of our charismatic Pentecostal friends and uh, neighbors and the nations in which you have gone? And all they want is benefit from the Lord. They want to get into the gift of prophecy, into casting out of devils. They want to work miracles. They want to do a lot of things that are spectacular and supernatural, but they are not concerned with obedience. 
Are there teachers and preachers and pastors giving them the gospel? No. Well, they say they are full gospel men and women. Full gospel church. A full gospel church that spells its gospel without obedience. That they don't do the will of God. Just the speaking in tongues. Just uh, the miracles and just the prophecy. Is that the gospel without the O of obedience? If we're going to preach the real gospel, there must be obedience. Obedience. And Jesus said so. Only they that do the will of my Father which is in heaven. In verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And uh, Jesus knew there will be those who will pervert the gospel of the Lord. There will be those who will not include obedience with the preaching of their gospel. And he reserved this for them. And every one of them that heareth these sins of mine, and doeth them not. And says, well, uh, you know, today it's we're saved by grace, and it's all by the grace of God. And uh, it doesn't matter how I live, it doesn't matter what I do, the grace will see me through. Then Jesus said, if he doesn't do any of these things, or doesn't do these things altogether, shall be likened to a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of age. You know how easy it is to build without foundation? Because some of the places where we're building are rocky, uh, rocky type of land. And digging a foundation on that type of uh, land is very, very hard. And there are some of, uh, you know, our uh, tempor contemporary colleagues, uh, missionaries from other soci missionary societies and from other uh, denominational churches, they too, they are building, and uh, perhaps we got there at the same time, and uh, they are building and they are preaching, or maybe some of the national preachers, and as they are preaching, it appears that their house, their building is going up very, very fast. Many of the people, they are just trooping, they are coming in, and uh, here you are, you are still on the foundation level, you are still laying the foundation, you talk of the grace of God. Immediately they get saved, they profess to be born again. You are talking of obeying the Lord, you are talking of fellowship, you are talking of being grounded, you are talking of reading the Bible, you are talking of making right the things that were wrong before in their lives. And because of that, it's very slow. But the other person that has no foundation at all, all he does is preach the grace of God, how God is merciful, how God is loving. And uh, how whatever you need, you can tell the Lord. And, uh, you know, they are getting healed and they are getting uh, prosperity and many, many things. And the work is just going on. Only for the rain to descend and the wind to blow. And all those people, when persecution, little persecution comes, everyone will be blown away. And it is that time we know who has been building according to pattern. Because, uh, you see, when you are built like that, and then the rain comes, persecution comes, all your people are staying. You know, before you were asking, you were wondering, you wanted to ask him, how are you doing it, that these people are just coming to you like this, there are so many within a short time, but now when the wind begins to blow, and all his people are scattered, he is the one that will come back to you and say, how are you doing it, that none of your people has led, preach obedience. Let the gospel you are preaching be the real gospel. The full gospel. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We're reading verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. If the people profess to love the Lord and they profess to have the grace of God, obedience will be there. They will keep the commandments of the Lord. In John chapter 15 verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. I've said the gospel we preach is the gospel of grace, the gospel of obedience. Number three, the gospel of salvation. 
And it's the full salvation, the free salvation. It's free because it is by grace. Let's look again at uh, the epistle to the Romans. Epistle to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Chapter 3, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace we, uh, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, the emphasis here is that it is free. It is free. All that Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary, we receive from the Lord free. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, sorry, chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are that are freely given to us of God. Freely given to us of God. Please let us emphasize as we're preaching this gospel that the benefits of the gospel, whatever those benefits are, salvation, holy living, sanctification, the power of the Lord, all that Calvary has made available, we cannot pay for them. They are free. In Romans chapter 8 verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So we're preaching salvation. Uh, salvation that is free, but then it's salvation that is full. It starts with salvation from sin. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Salvation from sin that gives freedom from sin is uh, the gospel that we preach. First John chapter 3 verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for the seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Then in Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Let's read from verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet, talking to Paul. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes. That's the gospel we preach. To turn them from, the, from darkness to light, that's through the gospel we preach. And from the power of Satan unto God, that's through the gospel, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, that's still part of the gospel, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. All that part of the gospel. So then the gospel we preach, number one, it's uh, the gospel of grace, but then it leads us into obedience, and we're preaching the gospel of salvation, free but yet full. Salvation from sin, salvation from all the forces and uh, influences of darkness, salvation from the power of Satan, salvation that gives both forgiveness as well as inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith in Christ. Then in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, 
and verse 19. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel. To who? Preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. Recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. To declare or to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. All this um, is part of the full salvation that we are called on to preach. We will be preaching to the poor. That means that the Lord will make them rich. If they are poor and um, because they have nothing, the Lord will provide for them. It's part of the gospel. If they are poor to the point that they are morally bankrupt, the Lord will change their lives and make their lives to be um, fascinating, challenging, and exciting. That's part of the gospel that we preach. If they are poor to the point that they are so foolish and they lack uh, necessary knowledge, even to behave uh, with courtesy and ethics, and apart from even the morals, uh, if they are so uncivilized, the gospel of the Lord that we preach will change their lives and um, they will live a life that is uh, challenging, a life that is courteous, respectful. He has sent me to heal the broken hearted. If uh, their homes are broken, if uh, they have got uh, wayward children that has just uh, battered and shattered their lives, the gospel we preach will heal their broken hearts. If they have been disappointed in life uh, to the point they even want to commit suicide, the gospel we are preaching will heal the broken heart. Then to preach deliverance to the captives. I want you seen in uh, some of the parts of the land you've gone to how the people have been under captivity to evil spirits and demons. The gospel we are preaching will deliver them from captivity. The recovering of sight to the blind. In fact, it will just set at liberty them that are bruised and will preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Matthew 24, verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We preach final salvation as well. So then, we preach the grace of God, make it available, make it accessible. We preach obedience through that grace. Then we preach salvation that is free and full, fruitful and final. Then we preach the power of God. That's the P of the gospel that we preach. One, we preach power over sin. Power over sin. Let's read that uh, Romans again, chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. The gospel, if it is the real gospel, the true gospel, the New Testament gospel, sets them free from sin. It does. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verse 5, we're told there are those who have a form of godliness, just the form, but they deny the power thereof from such turn away. Don't have anything to do with a type of gospel that denies the power of godliness, that has no power to make the people who receive the gospel live a different life, a changed life. Don't be satisfied with the form of godliness. What's the form of godliness? The liturgy, uh, the form of service. Uh, we know the songs, we know the uh, form of worship, we know this, we know that, we know the outward appearance of uh, godliness, we know the, how to talk as a pretending Christian. Don't be satisfied with that, but get into the power of the gospel and preach it. And let that come into their lives and change their lives. 
But then we have had so much uh, from theologians telling us um, the age of miracles for them is past. And really, you know, it eventually happens to them as they preach. They never see a miracle. And uh, true enough for them, they never even read about a real, a true miracle. They don't seem to get across any magazine that, that talks of a real miracle. For them, it is past, and it appears that God seems to keep even such good magazines away from them. And the experience and the power keeps everything away from them. And they never know anything about the power of the gospel uh, that sets a man free from sickness, that heals the sick. But for you, please, if you preach the gospel at all, preach the whole thing. Either all or nothing. And the gospel has power to save from sin and power to heal from sickness. In Luke chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils, and, and to cure diseases. And he gave them power and authority over all devils, A-L-L, -L, all devils, and to cure diseases. He gave them power. You know, I'm sure that these people who say the age of miracles is past, God has never given them power. You know, if he gave them the power, they won't say what they are saying. And if you know the Lord, if you really seek after the Lord, the Lord is the same, the word of God is the same, and Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. The gospel we are preaching has power over sickness in Luke chapter 10 verse 19 Luke chapter 10 verse 19 behold I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you that gospel has power over evil spirits, referred to here as serpents and scorpions. They are referred to here as serpents and scorpions because of what they do and how they operate. As uh, serpents, they go sometimes unnoticed and they give uh, the poison to the, uh, to the people uh, that they strike and uh, they strike and then go away. And the person may think it's another thing causing the problem. But you know it says, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and to tread on scorpions. My brothers, my sisters, um, those of us who are in African countries in particular, and those of us in the third world, you must understand that there is uh, the power of evil spirits. And, uh, but we thank God the gospel has power over those spirits. You know, uh, even people that have come here, I was uh, talking with the two American Negroes here in Nigeria, and they said the things they have seen, that if they write back home to tell the people in America that they will not believe. In fact, it so happened that the terrible uh, work of evil spirits against them was so great that their driver had to take them to a white garment church. Think of a Negro American having to bath with holy water, having to burn candle. And uh, many things that uh, they didn't know about before that uh, if anybody told them, oh, they'll say uh, all that is superstition. Eventually, uh, when all the things they got in the white garment churches could not help them, they had to come. And thank God for the gospel that has power over spirits. And we pray just a simple prayer. And they got a great result out of that. You know what they did? 
they went to the embassy and they got uh, the uh, brother was uh, the title of that man that they brought the and the high commissioner of a particular uh, of a particular nation and they said from experience they know a lot of them who are suffering from this sin and they brought the high commissioner to uh, to see us uh, in the church so that we'll be able to have a way of ministering to these people from America, from uh, Jamaica, from West Indies, from all these places, so as to minister to them because they are suffering. Some of them, they go to the embassy, they say, I, I want to lose everything I have in this country, give me uh, my whatever it is, and let me run back home, that it is too much for them. Think of uh, one of these people just having an appointment somewhere at uh, maybe 10 o'clock uh, in the morning, and uh, somebody saying, uh, in this country, you'll never make it. You'll never get anything. And she was determined, you know, with all those business uh, knowledge and administration and the capital, everything was there. But the Nigerian said, you won't get anything in this country. And she had that appointment. She was right here, right there before the time. While she was at the door, flies covered her all through. And she was taking away the flies when the time of appointment reached. She was still taking away the flies when the person she was going to see, when the person passed her and went away. And after taking care of the flies, then went back home. Think about it. But the gospel that has power. Power against spirits. And you know everywhere you go, let's preach the real gospel, the full gospel. And the Bible gospel, not this watered down type of thing, they remove the O from the gospel, they remove even the full salvation, they remove the power away from it. How then are they preaching the gospel? Only they just say grace, grace, no obedience, no holiness, no power over uh, all these uh, various things in life. But thank God for the real gospel. And if you'll take away with you the real gospel and the full gospel, it's the power of God. And you'll find it to be the power of God. In uh, Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. The power of the Holy Ghost that assists the believing, the baptized believer to speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall do what? They shall recover. They shall recover. And in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. That's part of the gospel. Now, I've told you that G of the gospel means grace. Preach the grace of God. O of the gospel is obedience. Preach obedience through the grace of God. S is salvation. Full salvation, free salvation, fruitful salvation, final salvation. Preach it. P of the gospel means power. Power over sin, over sickness, over satanic attacks and influences, over spirits. And also it means power of the Holy Ghost. Then E of the gospel, evangelization of the world. As a gospel preacher, you must not only be concerned with preaching the gospel, but equipping, motivating, and sending others to preach the gospel, to evangelize. Evangelism must be the heartbeat of the missionary. And uh, you must want to evangelize with all the time at your hand, with all the power that you have, with all the communication techniques that you have, with the literature, with media, with everything. Evangelize. But then move other people to evangelize. And, uh, you know, just stand there and preach. If it's the real gospel, it will influence and motivate you yourself to want to evangelize. And then make you to equip and train other people to want to evangelize. In um, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. 
all nations all nations until all nations are having this true gospel this real gospel this uh, new testament gospel we must not rest you must not complain about uh, being tired about being weak remember you are saved millions are waiting to be saved remember you have tasted the power of the world to come Others are hungry and thirsty, waiting for somebody to tell them. Remember that God has given you all that uh, Calvary has purchased. You have experienced some of them, and you are still to experience some of them, but then you have them available. You know where they are in the Bible. And if you really seriously want them, you can claim them for yourself. But others are even ignorant of their existence. Therefore, make sure that you have this uh, thing within you to go and teach all nations but then uh, don't uh, go and uh, you are in a particular country now and because there is more zeal than knowledge you have not really taught where you are then you jump up and you go to another place you know there are people like that and they are, they are counting how many countries of the world they have reached you know, it's easy to cover all the countries of the world if you have the money to travel in two years. If you spend a day in Ghana and just uh, have a church there and then you have an hour message there and preach and keep it on record, I preached in Ghana. Then go to Ivory Coast and spend a day and then go to Burkina Faso and spend a day and find a church of 20 people somewhere and make them happy and say how many of you want the Lord Jesus Christ in your life and they raise up their hands and you tell them now that's the gospel you know the Lord is wonderful he came to save you want to be saved and then they raise up their hands then you, you, you move over then you go to uh, Holland and then you get some uh, people there uh, who are having prison ministry and then you go to the prison where all those prisoners just come together and uh, you have about a hundred of them because uh, if they don't come to hear the gospel maybe they'll send them to the cutting grass and therefore they go there and you take the pictures and now you preached in Holland within two years you might go over 100 countries have you done what the Lord said we should do? no you just want adventure just trotting around the globe but Stay somewhere and do something concrete and let people know that you have preached the gospel. Many of these evangelists that are saying they have reached 60 countries and sometimes they tell us uh, the names of those countries and you get there, you can't see the mark of their feet, their footprint. Even the literature they said they distributed, you can't see anything. They didn't saturate that nation, that country with the gospel. As for us, let us do an enduring work where we are. If you get anywhere, uh, make sure that before you even have any mind of praying to ask uh, the ministry or the headquarters here uh, to send you any other place, make sure that the footprint of uh, the preaching of the gospel is so sound there that those people, they will never forget. And any other gospel church that is in that other place, they will be referring to that place as standard. You know what happens in Nigeria here? When a minister is doing something, they have the yardstick, they have the standard. Is it like they do it at deeper life? That's a standard for them. If they are going to hold the crusade, they want to ask themselves, is it how they did it in deeper life? If they are going to organize revival meeting, miracle meeting, even though they are not of deeper life, they have a standard they are referring to. And they are saying, is it like deeper life? Let it be so where you are, in the countries where you are, that eventually everybody will know. And any other person that comes to preach the gospel in that place, uh, even the onlookers will say, uh, you are not preaching the full gospel. You are not preaching like deeper life. They include sanctification. They include holy living. They include casting out devil. They include this and they include that. And I believe that uh, the time will come in every nation that we go, where the work is so established that people will look up to it as standard Bible Christian work that is being done. And uh, it says, go ye therefore, teach all nations. Now, let's remind ourselves that the apostles did not go to all nations just in one year. They stayed in Jerusalem, then they went to Judea, then they went to Samaria. 
Did you see anywhere they, they went where the city or the province or that nation was not robbed before they left? Were they just uh, trotting about, just going about? And saying, well, he told us, go into all nations. And they were going to all nations, just going about. No, they didn't do it that way. Have you seen Paul getting anywhere? And uh, the people, the idol worshippers, they didn't get so offended. You know, whenever Paul went, and went anywhere, some people were throwing their idols into the fire. Some people were throwing the, their rocks or their stones on Paul. There was trouble. Was some, one way or the other. And everybody knew that somebody came to town. You cannot live now where you are. You cannot leave that place and say, well, I'm going to another place. In the city where you are, some people don't even know that you are in town. That anything has been done. So you shouldn't think that now I've done something that I want to go to another place now. Uh, you know, this is not pride. This is just to tell you, to encourage you. You know, for example, if I died today, all the papers, even the papers that don't like uh, Christianity, you know, they'll bring it out because they believe that this is one of the preachers in Nigeria. They may not like what we're preaching, but they know that deeper life is present in Nigeria. You understand what I'm saying? It ought to be so with every one of our ministers. Uh -uh, like father, like children. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> it ought to be like that. So everywhere we go, uh, we ought to know that a real work must be done. And uh, I'm not ready to die yet. <laughs> and uh, you are not ready to die either. But uh, what we're saying is that by the grace of God, the work will be well done. That uh, in that nation where God has sent you, everybody will know that something is going on. Then in... Um, Mark chapter, 5, chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 20 and verse 21. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they shall they that have not heard shall understand. So then, the gospel we're preaching is the gospel of grace. Then it should include obedience, then salvation, then the power of God, then evangelization of the world. Let that zeal be in all our members that come in contact with our preaching of the gospel. And then life in Christ and the life of Christ. That's what the gospel does for us and in us and through us. The ultimate goal is that the Lord himself will develop in us the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ that we might be conformed to, the, to that image in Romans chapter 8 verse 29 Romans chapter 8 verse 29 for whom he did for know he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren so when we preach the gospel, let them have the life of Christ if they are having the real gospel, so that we will know for both ministers and members of the church, when they really receive the gospel, the true gospel, the real gospel, the New Testament gospel, they are being conformed to the image of Christ, the image of his Son. In Romans chapter 6, verse 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Conformity to the life of Christ. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. 
I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So let's emphasize as we are preaching the gospel, that we preach the grace of God, obedience to the Lord, salvation that is full and free, fruitful and final, the power of God over sin, sickness, Satan, and spirits, and the power of the Holy Ghost. Then we'll preach evangelization of the world, and we we'll motivate and influence everybody that listens to our gospel preaching to evangelize like that. And everyone is being led into a life in Christ, life of Christ, that is conformed to the image of the Son of God, a life that is pure, a life that is undefiled, uncompromisingly holy. That's what the Lord has given us to do. That's the commission he has given us. Preach the gospel. We cannot keep silent. This is the time we must put all our strength and all our ability and the gifts and the talents into the preaching of the gospel. And as we go, please do it. At every time of opportunity, preach the gospel, the real gospel. Let's stand up and pray. Preaching that gospel Don't let's be diverted to any other thing. Preach the gospel. Preach it. Preach it effectively. The gospel. Our gracious Father, we thank you very much for this time. Thank you, Lord, for what you have taught us through our leader. We thank you, Father, Lord, for reminding us of the call with which you have called us. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, because we knew that you have great things ahead of us. And because you want to expose us to what you've got for us in future, Father, we thank you because right now, Lord, as you've passed on your message unto us, we're asking, Lord, that every one of us, Lord, by your grace, will be sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit, that, Lord, at every opportunity, Father, will preach the word, will preach the gospel. Father, we're asking, Lord, that by the enablement of the Holy Spirit, Father, every ingredient of the gospel shall be brought to the knowledge of the people in the name of Jesus. Now, we believe that the truth has got power to deliver. It has got the power to save. Father, we pray, Lord, that as we go back to our countries, as we open our mouth to preach, we are praying, Father, that, Lord, by your spirit, Father, the message of the gospel shall reach the people in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, we thank you, Father, because we know that as much as we open ourselves to you, you are ready to work to us to the praise and glory of your name. Father, at this hour, we just want to bow before you. We are saying, Father, we indeed we are very grateful. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us again of all that we have to preach without favor, without fear of men. Lord, we believe you've called us, and by your grace, as Paul said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Father, Lord, we are consecrating our life unto you. And we are